Hi! Welcome to part two of my episode about the dawn of hip-hop. In this part, we'll get to know my favorite early hip-hop hero, Grandmaster Flash, and we'll take a pretty close look at just what his contributions to hip-hop were and what he does. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about Africa Bombada, and we'll close by looking at the state of hip-hop in the end of the 1970s and just how it set off on the road from being a small-time local scene to becoming the worldwide mammoth enterprise that we know today. I'm Peter, and you're watching We Need to Talk About Music. Joseph Sadler, who came to be known as Grandmaster Flash, was a pretty different kind of kid from Herc. A self-described geek, he had a knack for electrical engineering and experimentation. From a very young age, he was obsessively taking apart anything that plugged into the wall to try to find out how it worked. The object of his greatest fascination, though, was his father's stereo, which he says he couldn't resist messing with at every opportunity, despite having been expressly forbidden from doing so. As he tells it, these early experiments subjected him to a truly inexcusable amount of corporal punishment. But he says these beatings taught him to think of record players and records as objects of reverence, which ironically made him want to experiment with them even more. Through his observations and through electrician courses at Samuel Gomper's Vocational and Technical High School, he eventually came to understand everything about how record players work. And then, when he was still in his early teens, he had a revelation that was every bit as important to the future of hip-hop as Herx. He had always been particularly fascinated by the groove in the record, what he calls the little black tunnel where the music lives. What he realized was that the needle's natural home is in that groove, and that any truly musical manipulation of a record player would have to allow it to stay there. This led to a major explosion of activity. Sadler invented what he called a wafer, a mat made of starched felt to go in between the record and the platter to allow them to move independently of one another. Today, it's usually called a slip mat. He was probably the first person to create a crossfader switch, which allowed him to freely and rapidly switch between two record players. He also invented what he calls his peekaboo system, a small separate amp connected to headphones allowing him to listen to one record player while the other one's playing on the PA. He searched long and hard to find a record player, the Technics S23, that had the power to accelerate fast enough to start playing from a dead standstill without a long wind-up. With these ingredients in place, and after many long hours of experimentation in his bedroom, he finally came up with this, what he calls his quick mix theory. All this really means is that for a typical song on a 33 and a third RPM record, four bars of music, the typical length of a break, is equal to about six rotations of the record. This very simple observation is the foundation on which the entire art form of turntablism has been built. With this insight in place, probably around the same time as Herc's back to school jam, he was able to create a technique of, as he puts it, using the record as a controller as well as a sound source. By marking the exact spot on the record where the break begins with a crayon, and then using his fingertips to backspin the record to that exact point, he was soon able to keep even extremely short sections of music looping in endless, rhythmically locked-in rotation. Once he had this basic technique in place, and with some help from the younger Grand Wizard Theodore, the inventor of scratching, who Flash calls his first prodigy, he was soon able to create a whole vocabulary of ways to make it more exciting, including many of the techniques hip-hop DJs have been using ever since. To give you a better idea of just what Flash was and is able to do with all this, the best thing is just to listen to something. Apache is an instrumental by Michael Viner's Incredible Bongo Band that was actually one of Cool Herc's signature records and has been called the national anthem of hip-hop. On the playlist, along with the original version, which is actually a cover of a song that was made famous 12 years earlier by the pre-British invasion London rock and roll band The Shadows, I'll throw their version up as well, 
I've included a loop of the raw drum break and Grandmaster Flash's remix of the song. The remix is from 2006, but it actually lines up pretty well with what you can hear Flash doing on tapes from the 70s, and there's definitely nothing he does here that he didn't know how to do then. One thing to notice first of all about the original version is that the break is extremely long. It goes on for a full 44 measures. It's probably this simple fact, even more than the general awesomeness of the song, that first attracted Cool Herc to it. With his merry-go-round technique, it would have been really difficult to get short breaks queued up in time, and it probably also would have been too jarring for the dancers to have the rhythm interrupted so often. For Flash, this was definitely less of a concern. He can keep a two-measure break going with no trouble, but it did give him a nice, expansive canvas to work with. Then notice that the original version, after an extremely awesome intro that's pretty much guaranteed to lure a bunch of people onto the dance floor, kind of cops out, going into about a minute and a half of meandering interactions between guitar, organ, and horn section that are kind of cool in their own way, but would definitely start to drag if you were trying to dance to it. Now let's have a look at Flash's version. Flash completely ignores all of that whack part, just taking the final few notes of organ solo out of context to use as a kind of disjointed intro, and then jumping straight into the fluttery guitar riff punctuated by horn hits and alternating with brief tastes of break that, at 1 minute 48 of the original track, pretty clearly announces that the good part has arrived. From this point, he basically leaves the structure of the song alone, and bits that are already doing their jobs well, he pretty much lets do their thing but he also makes constant little modifications to keep things interesting. This good part announcement, for instance, he lets play on both turntables simultaneously so that he can use the crossfader to switch rapidly between them, creating a kind of seasick effect. This is something you'll see him doing a lot if you watch videos of him performing. That leads to another exciting horn figure, a kind of fanfare that announces the arrival of the proper break. Flash immediately picks up on this as a key and, in the original version, underutilized structural feature. He plays it through four full times before finally letting the break drop. The drum break itself, as you might expect, occupies the majority of Flash's version. He extends it to nearly four times its original length, but he doesn't just loop it and let it play through, which could get pretty monotonous. He finds ways to constantly vary it up, punctuate it, and generally keep it interesting. Unlike some drum breaks, this one is constantly but subtly changing, as the bongos play around, generating different counter rhythms against the constant drummer. Flash takes full advantage of this, selecting brief segments to loop and focus on for a few bars at a time, punctuating the transitions between them with brief bits or even full repetitions of the horn fanfare. About two-thirds of the way through, Flash suddenly brings in the horn and guitar figure that comes at the end of the break, letting it play through once and then jumping back in for another 40 bars or so. This is a particularly interesting move, because for someone listening to the original version of the song, this would be one of the most exciting moments, when the really cool stuff from the intro finally comes back. But Flash sacrificed the intro to get rid of the boring stuff that comes after so someone listening to his version has never heard this stuff before. By giving it to us a little bit early, Flash not only breaks up the monotony of the now extremely long break, but also gives us a memory of this music, so that we can have at least a little bit of that satisfying feeling of return when the break finally does end. The original version ends with a full repetition of the intro, and Flash pretty much just lets that play through maybe adding a little bit of reverb, possibly in a nod to Herc, but with no looping, scratching, record switching, or other techniques that I can detect. This stuff is just so successful on its own that it doesn't really need any help, and Flash is the kind of performer who's more interested in the experience of dancers and listeners than he is in showing off. When Flash first came up with this stuff, he had a pretty hard time getting it accepted, at that time, it was considered taboo for DJs to even touch the surface of a record, much less draw on it with a crayon, and he found himself blacklisted from clubs, 
For several years, he was relegated to a few public parks where he was allowed to access the electrical system and would perform for whoever cared to listen, which frequently was a whole lot of people. A few years ago, Grandmaster Flash published a video letter to Cool Herc in which he speaks directly to his fellow DJ, who he says he hasn't seen or spoken to in years. He says that he wishes the two of them could be closer, because they're the last two left. More on why he says that in a minute. And he gives Herc credit for being the first on the scene, for having the greatest sound system, and for being an inspiration to Flash and many others but not really for much else. The video was prompted by a Google Doodle honoring the anniversary of the Back to School Jam, but its main purpose seems to be to respond to Herc's repeated insistence that he should be regarded as the one and only true founder of hip-hop. Flash spends the majority of the video right at his turntables, demonstrating what he does, telling the story of how he learned how to do it, and comparing it to his interpretation of what Herc does. I'd say he makes a pretty compelling argument that he merits at least co-founder status, but apparently Herc didn't really agree, so you should probably check it out yourself and see what you think. In one of the most memorable moments in the video, Flash says to Herc, Yes, Herc, I did learn that you had the greatest sound system and the most incredible echo chamber, and you was the first to publicly play those grooves and drum breaks. But the technical aspect of this... No, Herc. I definitely did not want to learn your technique. I went elsewhere. All due respect. Where he says he did go was to disco DJs, who he was mostly able to hear on the radio, and who, he says, may have been playing records he wouldn't have been interested in, but were doing it with absolutely perfect timing. Flash's willingness to admit to having been influenced by anything other than his own sheer brilliance places him in contrast with Herc, but in this case I think he might be being a little bit too modest. Surely these disco DJs provided him with a source of inspiration by showing him what was possible, but if he couldn't see what they were doing, it doesn't seem likely that he learned all that much from them in terms of technique. Also, the response he received when he tried to bring his techniques into clubs is a pretty good indication that they were just as new to disco insiders as they were to anyone else. The results of what Flash was doing were pretty hard to argue with, though, and it wasn't too long before other DJs, starting with Grand Wizard Theodore, started to catch on. A hip-hop scene gradually started to form in the Bronx and eventually spread to the other boroughs. According to legend, this process was given a bit of a boost when, from July 13th to 14th, 1977, most of New York City was affected by a blackout. After that, for some reason, a whole lot more people seemed to have had record players, PA systems, and all the other equipment you needed to start a hip-hop crew. A big advantage of Flash's technique was that the rhythmic solidity it provided made continuous rapping over the beat possible. At some point in the mid to late 70s, dates are a bit unclear, Flash started to be joined by Cowboy Keefe, the first person to rap over Flash's beats, according to Flash, who's also credited with inventing the term hip-hop. The hip-hop, hippie to the hippie to the hip-hip-hop at the beginning of Rapper's Delight is probably imitating Cowboy, or maybe imitating someone else imitating Cowboy. Soon after, they were also joined by Melly Mel, the first rapper to call himself an MC, and his brother Kid Creole, forming Grandmaster Flash and the Three MCs. Later expanded to Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five MCs with the addition of Scorpio and Rahim. In 1978, the group was granted a weekly spot at the club Disco Fever in the Bronx, from which point hip-hop rapidly became a mainstay in clubs in the outer boroughs and upper Manhattan. Fortunately for us, around this time, a bustling black market for illicitly recorded tapes of hip-hop performances started to form, and a lot of these tapes still exist. As far as I can tell, there is no recording of anything before about 1976, but we can get a pretty good idea of what Flash, Herc, and others were up to in the late 70s. I'll put as many of these tapes as I can find on a playlist for you. By the end of the decade, Flash had achieved legendary status within the rapidly growing hip-hop underground. In 1979, he and his group started to make official recordings, although 
Far too many of these records, including their most famous song, The Message, use studio musicians to record the beats, and so don't actually include any direct contribution from Flash at all. Flash also began, initially through contacts in the graffiti world, to head downtown and form alliances with people in the punk community that had been forming in parallel with hip-hop in the East Village. These relationships ended up playing an important role in helping hip-hop avoid becoming a momentary novelty, as it was in danger of doing in the early 80s, and allowing it to mature into the long-standing art form we enjoy today. That, though, is definitely a story for another time. And then there's the third guy. When I started researching for this project, I was incredibly disappointed to learn that Africa Bombada, the third person who's typically been credited as one of the founders of hip-hop, has been in the news since the last time I looked into him. Basically, he's been accused of taking advantage of his position in the Universal Zulu Nation organization he founded in order to commit horrendous crimes against kids the organization was supposed to be helping. He hasn't been convicted of anything, nor can he be due to the statute of limitations in the state of New York, but he has been removed from the organization, and I haven't seen anything to indicate that the claims against him are in any way spurious. Apparently, among many people in and beyond Bombada's Bronx River community neighborhood, this has been common knowledge for quite some time. Even Melly Mel recently stated that he heard about it decades ago. I had been really excited to talk about Africa Bombada, but this information throws all of his motivations into question, and it's robbed me of my enthusiasm. Not that I would prefer not to know. The truth is always best. It's just a drag. Still, though, there is some stuff about him that's pretty historically interesting, so I'll briefly get into it. Lance Taylor, as he was then known, was probably still a young teenager when he first heard DJ Cool Herc perform. But by that point, he was already a warlord. Literally, that was his title, in one of the most powerful gangs in the Bronx, the Black Spades. Taylor was a pretty impressive kid who had grown up in a politically active household, and around this same time he won a trip to Africa in an essay contest. Maybe it's true, as he stated, that his experiences in Africa inspired him to reject violence and seek a more creative outlet for his community. Or maybe he just recognized that the influence of gangs in the Bronx was on the wane and looked for a way to retain his position of power. Either way, he soon changed his name to Africa Bombada and started the process of essentially converting a large part of the Black Spades, as well as a few other gangs, into a more or less non-violent collective dedicated to peace, love, unity, and having fun, which was originally just referred to as the Organization, and later named the Universal Zulu Nation. It's not quite clear just how immediately hip-hop became involved in this movement, but at least by 1977 or so, Bombada had become active as a DJ and was hosting block parties around the South Bronx. To me, that seems fairly late for someone who's supposed to be one of the founders of hip-hop. There were other DJs besides Herc and Flash who were active before that point. Still, though, there are some reasons. As I see it, there are basically two ways in which Bombada contributed to the foundation of hip-hop. The first, and maybe the most important, is simply through his influence. As the leader of a major organization like the Zulu Nation, he was in a very different position from other hip-hop pioneers. When he became a DJ, he was able to influence a whole lot of other people to become involved in hip-hop along with him, and he was in a position to assist them in finding venues and gaining access to equipment. This had a big impact on the scale of hip-hop, and it was a major factor in turning it from a tiny niche into a true movement. His second big contribution has to do with the eclecticism of hip-hop. The thing people always mention when they talk about Bombada, like Herc's system and Flash's technical prowess, is his record collection. Initially, hip-hop beats were pretty much limited to breaks from funk records and the occasional particularly funky disco track. Bombada seems to have been the first person to realize that a really awesome beat could come from almost anywhere. By obsessively mining record stores, looking for breaks hidden away in rock, pop, and music from around the world, he encouraged other DJs to also broaden their fields of vision. <laughs> 
setting a precedent that's characterized a lot of the best in hip-hop throughout its history. A good example of this is his most famous song, Planet Rock, which he recorded with his group The Soul Sonic Force in 1982. This was the song that started the electro subgenre, and it's been called the first hit record of serious hip-hop. It's built on re-recorded grooves borrowed from two different songs by the pioneering German techno group Kraftwerk. Not exactly something that Herc or Flash would have been so likely to be tuned into. Okay, enough about him. By 1979, the influence of the founders had done its work, and there was a lot going on. By this point, there were a bunch of younger DJs who had figured out Flash's tricks, and the Bronx and even some of the other boroughs were exploding with new crews, like the Cold Crush Brothers, the Crash Crew, the Treacherous Three, Grand Wizard Theodore and the Fantastic Five, and the Funky Four Plus One. This new generation brought a more tightly structured, regimented vibe to hip-hop. If you remember all the Killer Bee stuff from the Wu-Tang Clan's first album, there was a lot of stuff like that. At least from within the scene, the founders were already starting to look pretty old-fashioned. That same year, two DJs, Mr. Magic in New York and Lady B in Philadelphia, started the first two radio shows to prominently feature for hip-hop. Also, a singer, guitarist, and music entrepreneur named Sylvia Robinson, who had been half of the 1950s vocal duo Mickey and Sylvia, had heard about hip-hop and thought it sounded like it could be lucrative. When she heard from her son about Big Bank Hank, a former manager of Cold Crush brother Grandmaster Kaz, who had the habit of spitting rhymes in the kitchen of a local pizza place, she started Sugar Hill Records and cobbled together Hank with a few other relative hip-hop outsiders to form the Sugar Hill Gang. In the summer of 1979, they entered the studio with a book of rhymes borrowed from Kaz and recorded a song over a re-recorded version of the break from Good Times by Sheik, one of Grandmaster Flash's favorite grooves. Rapper's Delight was released in September and quickly became a nearly unavoidably ubiquitous crossover hit. With that, the era of hip-hop as a relatively small neighborhood subculture was over, and the era of hip-hop as big business had begun. Okay, that's probably about as good a place to end it as any. If you'd like to hear more, just let me know, and I'd be really happy to make another episode to talk about some of the stuff that went down in the 80s. Be sure to check back here soon for something completely different, or just hit subscribe so you don't have to worry about it. For the meantime, stay healthy and happy, and don't forget to listen to some music now and then. <laughs>